Hello, this is Mike Swanson. This is a segment of the Past American Century. Got a very special guest with me today. I'm speaking with Doug Campbell, who runs the uh, podcast titled The Dallas Action. It's one of the uh, crucial uh, podcasts that explore the Kennedy assassination. It's probably the one that does the deepest amount of actual research and looking through the documents and, and, and sharing the findings that Doug has and his guests. How you doing today, Doug? I'm doing very good, Mike. Thanks for having me, buddy. And thank you for the nice words. Very nice to say. Oh, it, it, it's it's uh, the truth. that you, You've got some new information, too, and I'm going to provide a link for anyone watching or listening to this on YouTube. You know, in, in the description of this video, there's a link to your podcast. They should sub definitely subscribe to it. Uh, and I've got a link also to this show that you just put up uh, because it has some startling uh, new information uh, in it. I, I was just going to ask you, I haven't had time to even listen to it. I just saw the title of it this morning in your description. And it caught my eye. I'm just so I can't help but ask you, you know, I don't know if you want to talk just about that, but I can't help but wonder <laughs> what is it about because you've got <laughs> found some information about someone that was high up of a very important person in the Central Intelligence Agency who's come out uh, recently with uh, some information. Yeah, well, uh, some uh, some allegations anyway. Uh, yeah. And it is very interesting. Yeah. It's a tantalizing story. There's a guy who, um, he is a former CIA agent. And as a matter of fact, he was the former station chief in Moscow. Um, that came out a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, I did delete those. I'm sorry, Mike. Um, or not a couple of years ago. Excuse me, I'm wrong. Let, let me start over. Um, this cat, Rolf Mowat Larson is his name. He was the um, my former Moscow station chief for the CIA, and he's made two presentations, very low-key, uh, one in November of last year and one of, in December of last year, um, claiming that while he was in the CIA uh, during his decades there, that he, that he did an investigation on his own, kind of down low, uh, okay. low-key on the Kennedy assembly. And um, claims to know who the mastermind is. And it's pretty interesting when you look at who this guy is and where he's at now. Um, he, he's a, he's a professor. He's on staff, runs, I think, two different think tanks over at the Harvard John F. Kennedy School of Government. Wow. So, yeah, that's interesting. And, and the interesting part is, is he's fingering someone within the CIA. Well, that's Says very Jake Esterline. Oh, really? And if, I, and if I remember right, Jake Esterlein was the guy that was in charge of the Bay of Pigs invasion? Is that, is that correct? He was in charge of the Bay of Pigs invasion. Um, he, he, he specialized in guerrilla warfare in World War II, which would, would make sense as far as the Kennedy assassination goes and who you're dealing with. But he was in charge of the Bay of Pigs operation, and he was also in charge of the Guatemalan coup uh, operation PB Success, which... Uh, which means that back then everybody, Hunt, Morales, Phillips, all those guys worked for him right. uh, during that thing. But what's interesting about that to me is he's the guy. He is, is he the guy that uh, just, in, in, from what I remember, is he the guy that the day before or something the Bay of Pigs invasion was to launch, he asked Richard Bissell to cancel it, and Bissell said no? Is that, is that correct, too? Maybe. I Maybe. I, I do not know. Anyway, that, that's how I'm trying to connect him in my mind. So, uh, but but yeah, very very important. I'm not saying I believe it all. It's just very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> to say the least. Well, yeah. it's interesting. I would love to, uh, and I made this point on the podcast. I would love to be able to walk that evidentiary trail that led him to Jacob Esterline as the mastermind of the Kennedy assassination. You know, there's no doubt about it. Um, all the things that Esther Lyme was a part of through those years, I think he would have the knowledge of the operations to be able to manipulate those things. But whether or not it's him, I don't know. You know, we haven't um, we haven't necessarily seen what it what it is that leads Mr. Moet Larson to that conclusion. You know, um, and how well, yeah, much detail he gave a, in those. You 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 and you're saying he was the CIA station chief of Moscow, right? Yeah, yeah. Rolf Mowat Larson. Again, I'm looking at it. I'm looking at. I found a biography of him on the foreign policy uh, website. 
which is a oh, critical. Oh, I didn't see that. It, 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 this says prior to his appointment at Harvard, he led the government's efforts at the Department of Energy and the Central Intelligence Agency to find and track potential nuclear terrorists and prevent a nuclear attack on the U.S. So I'm guessing that's something around 9-11, I would guess, right? Uh, I would assume. Yeah. And now he's a Harvard professor. So that, so this is a interesting figure to be making uh, presentations about the assassination. You, it, it, makes you, it, it makes you sit up and take notice when you read the guy's bona fides. Um, he's not somebody that was, that was drummed out of the CIA or – drummed out of government service for any reason. And he, he, you know, doesn't seem to have the, the, the same makeup and maybe the same profile as some of the other, you know, so-called, quote-unquote, whistleblowers, I guess. Or um, I, I don't know. It's different. There's something about the guy maybe maybe more gravitas than what we've seen in the past. But I know there's a lot in our community that are automatically going to mistrust the guy, and I do too. In a sense, I'm the way. Let me back up. I don't want to say that that I mistrust the guy. I disagree with a lot of what he's saying because he still has Oswald firing from the depository. You know. Okay. Um. He he still has Oswald firing the rifle, and uh, you know I'm sorry. I just I just don't believe that. I don't believe that. And, and that's you know when we were talking before, you know about this is still a limited hangout in a way. It seems like you know. Um, they're just hanging out maybe a little more. Well, the, the other thing that we've seen from the Central Intelligence Agency officially <laughs> is uh, they've released <laughs> this biography of John McCone a couple years ago, and it talks about a limited hangout and claims that there is a so-called benign cover-up with the CIA and the Kennedy assassination. And the argument is that Oswald... Uh, was connected with people that had a loose connection with the Central Intelligence Agency. So people could have inferred that the CIA was involved in all this when when they weren't because of these connections. Right. So they wanted to cover it all up to prevent, you know, exactly. prevent all this trouble. Uh, and, and that's kind of the official line, I would say, now because it's in a, a CIA official biography of John McCone. So that's, and that's different than... <laughs> You know, uh, you know, the way the public was, we were trained to believe Oswald was a lone nut and completely had no connections to anybody. That's obviously not uh, what's said today. And then also uh, there's other CIA people like Brian Littell, uh, who was a CIA specialist on Cuba and Castro, who try to connect Oswald to Castro and say it's a Castro plot. So for this guy to be implicating... CIA people, such as Estraline, is being involved. That's really something unusual. Yeah, yeah, definitely noteworthy. Because, and like you say, I think we've seen, if just off the top of my head, we've we've seen a couple, three different versions of the limited hangout. It's like like you were mentioning uh, Brian Latell stuff. Uh, Castro knew about it uh, and monitored Oswald, but did nothing to stop it. Um, I think we've gotten a variation that it was uh, it was Castro operatives masquerading as anti-Castro operatives that manipulated Oswald. Um, you know, Castro agents. Um, so yeah, this is uh, and, then, and then just just the outright accusation that Castro and the KGB manipulated Oswald. And this is different. This is a guy that, <clears throat> from what I've read, makes the point in his presentation that. Lee Oswald acted like somewhat, somebody getting, in, the way he put it, was getting the squeeze put on him by a CIA case officer. What does that mean, you think? Uh, uh, manipulated. His point he, that he made was that, you know, this, and this gets into a whole different area here, but he says that the CIA were manipulating Oswald by blackmailing him, trying to, uh, what, what they're doing is, threatening to expose the fact that he shot at Edwin Walker in April. Okay. But that doesn't make a lot of sense because all of Oswald's shenanigans kind of started, you know, before that, you know. Um, that doesn't make any sense to me because, and again, I'm not thoroughly convinced that, you know, Oswald ever shot at Walker. Yeah, I'm not either. And, and even if he did, there's certainly 
I, I don't think the CIA would have had evidence that he did so either <laughs> to blackmail him. No, with, right? no. <laughs> so what was the evidence? No, like, no. You know, where is it? Man? <laughs> not, not unless they were already tracking him at the time. Well, I mean, you know, there, there's well, no real solid evidence that he did it. You know, it's just uh, except Marina Oswald saying that later after the assassination happens. Yeah, yeah. But this is very interesting. This guy, um, I would love to know. Uh, I would love to know what led him to Esterline. I would love to talk to the guy. Yeah, I would. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> I'd love to get him on the podcast. That would be fun. Well, I wonder if there's as did a Google search as we're speaking, and it looks like he spoke at a conference run by Valerie Plame, all right, uh, yeah. in November. I wonder if there's Maybe there's a tape of the conference or something. You know, I did a YouTube, uh, a quick YouTube search on the guy and found nothing that uh, um, had him talking about uh, the Kennedy assassination. Everything was, uh, you know, the other stuff, the energy okay. and terrorism. And, um, okay. So, yeah. Um, man, I've tried. I would love to, uh, uh, I'd love to hear it. Well, is is there lots of videos of this guy? I mean, is he is he been on TV a lot and stuff? It's I, I don't know. I, I saw a few on on YouTube, but uh, to be honest, uh, they didn't. Uh, they weren't about his his uh, presentation on the Kennedy thing, so I didn't watch him, dude. I didn't. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> I just kind of yeah. All that other stuff would have probably been over my head. Well, here's here's the, the if you type spy seminars, here's the conference. I found oh, that. you found it? Yeah. Well, we're Michael. Speaking. So, I but I don't. They Michael. have photographs. Help. Photographs of the conference. 120 people there. Um. Here's a picture of the guy marked for. Here's his, here's the title of the speech marked for assassination. Who killed JFK? Well, then you you, you know, also mm -hmm. makes yeah. You know, it also makes me wonder why you know why is he even saying this stuff? <laughs> it's what I always wonder too, right? So about these kind well, of well, it doesn't seem like he's well. That's a thing um, that it, it struck me immediately. He doesn't have a book for sale on the JFK assassination they can find anywhere, uh, which it seems to be the norm that when this kind of thing happens. Um, the person uh, coming to the floor with the info usually has a book to sell, uh, and this guy doesn't. Uh, yeah. There's no, yeah. you know, there's not any publicity behind it. It just, he just sort of made these two presentations, and word got out. Um, and I'll tell you how I found out about it. Uh, my friend Ted Rubenstein sent me a link to an article at jfkfacts.org that Jefferson Morley wrote um, just a couple of weeks ago. Oh, okay. um, and it was it was about um, an individual named Charles Thomas um, who met with uh, met with an unfortunate demise um, as far as uh, you know what he knew uh, some he was a, sort of about the same kind of thing he um, he made a, a uh, 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 I'm trying to find my notes here uh, Mr. Charles Thomas um, apparently worked for the State Department um, down in Mexico and throughout the 60s heard some things about Oswald and about Oswald's uh, Mexico City soiree and when he tried to make noise about it he was drummed out of his job and ended up uh, um, committing suicide like Roger Craig did but uh, Jefferson Morley's article started out about that and then he mentioned uh, you know the last couple of paragraphs uh, he mentioned this Rolf Mowat Larson and uh, there were a couple of links there and I followed that and that's how I got into the Thing. That's how I learned about it. So, thank you, Mr. Morley. Yeah. Well, as far as I know, your podcast this morning is it? Well, it's certainly the first I've heard of it, and it doesn't look like anyone in the so-called JFK assassination community uh, has, you know, looked into this guy's claims or his presentation at all. I think it seems like you're the first one. Well, I uh, yeah, Mr. Morley brought it up. Uh, of course, he uh, brought it to the forefront. I, I, I got to give him the credit, and of course, Ted. But I would like to uh, very much like to talk to this dude. I'd love to sit down and have a conversation with him, and let him walk me through some of the details. You know, why Esterline? 
of all people. Well, the conference itself, it looks like they're all intelligence people that were speaking. Uh, Val, Valerie Plain, yeah. you know, but this other, I'm looking at the list of these, I don't know, I've never heard of these people, but Glenn Carl, career CIA operations officer serving on four continents. Acting Deputy National, you know, you know, Bruce Held, Associate Deputy Secretary of Energy, Acting Under Secretary of Energy for Nuclear Security. Uh, I mean, it's you know, uh, CIA. Another guy, Mr. James Lawler, CIA Senior Intelligence Service, which is actually SIS is the initials in that. That's one of these units that. Uh, or divisions of CA that John Newman's actually written a lot about or, or been focusing on. Uh, so I interesting uh, <laughs> collection of speakers, to say the least. It's not, you know, I, I don't think I've ever been. Yeah, to yeah. Like there, there, there doesn't seem to be, um, you know, any any anybody presenting speculative research. This <laughs> this is a this is this material was presented. I think when you look at the context, the surroundings, the event. Um, you know, I don't. I don't think that event was for public consumption so much, which makes it even more interesting to me. Well, let me look at the audience real quick. They got pictures well, of the audience, and um, because it's in Santa Fe, right? And, so. and let me see. They have. Well, I saw some. But anyway, I, I'm getting sidetracked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking if, if the audience is full of older people, all of them are older people, then that could be just people in the area, basically, is what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. But if event. there's some young, young, uh, young, young guys in suits, then hey, maybe this was a different kind of thing. You know? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. But yeah. anyway, yeah. So, well, what other stories and things are you been following lately? Well, or your guests, I, I, or, or, I, or your guests. What's what's uh? Oh wow, we've you know that's the thing. It's so it's so scattershot. We're all over the place. Um, Ted and I have been doing this thing. There is a um, a presentation that a guy named Daniel Sheehan did. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Danny Sheehan. Danny Sheehan uh, kind of made his made his bones years ago, but he it was his lawsuit. Uh, that resulted in the exposure of the Oliver North and Richard Secord network and the Iran Contra affair back in the eighties. And Danny Sheehan's always been sort of an activist kind of lawyer, um, activist researcher, activist lawyer, I suppose. And um, and uh, like I say, he's gotten a few wins for the good guys. And a few years ago, he came out uh, uh, with a presentation to some. Uh, students of his uh, out at uh, the Romero Institute in California and basically came out with what he says is inside information on the Kennedy assassination that he was given um, by Santo Traficante, uh, the Florida mob boss. And uh, we've been going through that and we've got a show that's going to upload in a couple of weeks. It's going to be a really long one. We're using sound bites and kind of going through that and analyzing uh, Mr. Sheehan's claims, or what he says uh, he claims are the claims of Santo Tropicante, and looking into that, um, I've been working a lot with a guy named, uh, sort of on the down low, not really working with, but swapping info and swapping research with um, David Boylan and Ted and Garland Brown, certainly, and you, and a couple of other people, but um, we're, there's, there's a lot of digging into the new files going on <laughs> with us, you know, um, and not necessarily with me targeted searches, uh, more vague, you know, I kind of like to flip through all of the new releases and just click on stuff and see what I find. It's amazing what you can find that way, too. Oh, you sent me some really incredible stuff about Vietnam that was, you just found a collection of these files in the new releases, and they weren't even titled. <laughs> it's just like, yes. you just found them randomly, and there's some amazing information there. With, with Daniel Sheehan, I don't, I, I watched um, a bunch of his videos, actually. And because um, yeah. what he was doing over the and he's just started a new series. Actually, I just noticed it last week. He's been doing uh, uh, courses at some college out, out in California, uh, and they film the film the classes. And he did one on the Kenny assassination, 
and now he's doing another one. I think it's about Trump or something. And but oh, but wow. I did, I've watched a lot of them. And uh, one thing I'll say is he's done a series about what he calls worldviews, and they've actually had a big influence on me. They're uh, about yeah. it's about. He has a category categorizes like seven different political philosophies, and, and ways of looking at the world people might have, and tries to explain where people you know where people are coming from, and that's helped me understand you know where where are people coming from, where am I coming from? It's it's so it's, it sounds kind of bland, but it's actually re- really interesting. But I don't know you know his Kennedy information. From what I understand, he's working on a book with Richard Billings. Uh, <laughs> that's really? good. Yeah, that's supposed to review well, now, all this stuff. See, that's that's uh, very interesting to me because Richard Billings pops up in a lot of strange <laughs> ways in a lot of strange places over the years. You know, um, the BioPoly affair, the BioPoly raid, Operation Tilt. You know, the, um, the 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 hit Castro operation that that some theorized was the one that was turned around by Castro and aimed at Kennedy. Uh, he was he was on the boat, actually. Um, the Flying Tiger, the yacht with uh, John Martino and William Pauley and uh, Rip Robertson and all those guys. He was actually out there with them. Um, a few years ago, man, I don't know if you remember the show I did. It was like a two-episode arc um, where Harold Weisberg you know, the old guard researcher, yeah. the uh, legendary researcher, Harold Weisberg, started alluding to, uh, I was digging through his archives, you know, the Weisberg archives, and I found all these letters that he had written to Dick Billings, to Richard Billings. Okay. And they were, they were describing their nervousness over their guilty knowledge of a burglary that had occurred in 1967. Hmm. And the burglary was this cat named Jack Corky Houston who had broken into Lauren Hall's home. And from what Weisberg and Billings are talking about back and forth in their letters, had stolen evidence from Lauren Hall's home. What? They're going back. <laughs> yeah. This is, this, I'll send you the links to uh, – yeah, man, when we get off here, I'll send you the links to those two shows. Um, there's so much information that I can't remember off the top of my head now, but it was really interesting because they're scared to death that the HSCA is going to find out. And the and you, you, you're reading – you're not – this is not, you know, some – this is somebody saying this. I mean, I'm reading letters that, that, that Weisberg wrote to Dick Billings during the time of the HSCA, and they're – they're really worried, you know, oh, my God, what if the HSCA knows about this? What, what if they know that, you know, this evidence or whatever it is? At one point, it was described as notebooks. But um, the day that Lauren Hall showed up to testify, his, his, his immunized testimony to the HSCA, Dick Billings and Harold Weisberg were in the front row. And wow. then they ended up going, yeah. And Weisberg describes Billings and him – Hall and his attorney going out after the testimony and just getting hammered drunk at a hotel bar. <laughs> and it's just the most fascinating. And for people, <laughs> yeah. for people who don't know, I don't, I don't think either one of us explained, but Dick Billings oh, was, yeah. was a reporter for Life magazine. And, yeah. and in the 1960s, when Kennedy was president, went on a couple you know, uh, raids with some of these Cuban mercenaries, anti-Castro mercenaries, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so he knew all these, he, knew a lot of these people. Did, did he what, go on a raid of uh, Lauren Hall? Did he know Lauren Hall back then? Well, he he certainly knew Lauren Hall. I would say so. Yeah, back then because Lauren Hall was um, he was actually supposed to go on that raid. Um, the what the Operation Tilt, what they call the Bio Poly affair, and then Rip Robertson told him that the FBI was looking for him in Florida, and which they were. So he beat a trail to New York for a few weeks and didn't get to go on that raid. Interesting bit of trivia. Jerry Patrick Hemming always claimed that the Minolta spy camera that Oswald had when he died yeah. was 
the serial number matched a camera that was supposed to have been lost on that raid. Mm. But I don't know. I don't know how much truth there is to that. But yeah, so I would say that Billings, he definitely knew Hall. Um, in the late 60s, uh, when the Garrison investigation was going on, he definitely knew Hall um, through Weisberg, as a matter of fact. There is a, there's a, a journalist named Daniel Akoka. Ted is very familiar with this guy's history. I've never he heard of him. He ended up getting murdered. Yeah, okay. he ended up getting murdered in the early 80s, I believe. Um, but Daniel Akoka was really tight with Billings. And at one point, Jim Garrison, and this is all going by those letters I found in the Weisberg archives, Garrison sends this other journalist, Akoka, out to Vegas to get the stolen material in 1967 from this Jack Houston dude, this guy that apparently stole it from the hall, but he never got it. The guy got cold feet and wouldn't yeah. give it to him. So Billings and yeah. Weisberg and Garrison, they were all – they were all aware that Hall had been burglarized and some evidence had been taken. Now, what that evidence ultimately turned out to be or not be, I don't know. I never was never able to ascertain that from digging through those letters of the archives. Um, what it might have been, who knows? But whatever it was, Weisberg was not – he did not object to Garrison getting it. Or, excuse me. He did not object to Garrison not getting it in the end, and he damn sure didn't want the HSCA to know about it in the seventies. It's pretty comical to read. I'll, uh, I believe I could find that stuff again for you and send it to you, but I'll definitely, uh, definitely send uh, send you the link to the show. I believe the episode was called "Guarding the Gates: The Weisberg Hall Burglary." Is what I call it. Okay, I'll, I'll link to yeah. the show. People can yeah. go yeah. back to the show. No, listen to it. It. Well, what you make one thing about the Daniel Sheehan stuff too is uh, over the past year, I know Larry Hancock and a few other researchers have been interested in these so-called Gene Wheaton names. Gene Wheaton was also someone in the CIA, right, that was naming people that were involved in assassination. And my understanding, though, is that um, this seems to be new uh, in the JFK community where people are researching this stuff, but. I believe he gave information, if not these names, to Daniel Sheehan back in the early 1980s. And that's where that story actually started. From what I understand, when Sheehan filed the lawsuit that – and I could be completely wrong here. Um, and, and I'm sure that uh, my buddy Ted will correct me, but I, I ought to know that. <laughs> I ought to know that because we just talked about it last week when we recorded the upcoming show. but. From what I understand, he the information that he got from Wheaton resulted in the lawsuit that resulted in the exposure of the of the Oliver North and Secord thing. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that even though some of the names are the same in the presentation that he gives uh, that 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 uh, Ted and I analyzed in the show, some of the some of those names do show up in the Wheaton evidence. Um, the names cross over, but in the presentation, she attributes all the information to Traficanti. Okay. That's what's interesting. In the, pres the presentation we're going through, I believe on YouTube, it's called JFK number 14 and 15, Santo Traficanti and the S-Force. Uh, it's pretty long. It's about two and a half hours, uh, and uh, you can, guys, you can hear uh, Ted and I uh, go through all this stuff in two weeks, exactly two weeks on the show. But, um, but you know, Mike, you, you you're right in in that he does have that really strong connection with uh, Gene Wheaton, um, and it was I was wondering myself. Well, I wonder why he doesn't attribute any of this information to him because the names sort of do cross over. Yeah. 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 But it's interesting stuff, man. It's very interesting stuff. But we'll go through and uh, tell tell a little more about the individuals that he talks about and, and some of the circumstances and events and analyze and well, this seems right and this doesn't seem right and you know doing what we do, man. 
Well, it's funny what one of the shows you did uh, was with Rob Clark about Guy Bannister and, <laughs> and David Ferry, and you and yeah. uh, I I put a segment of that show up on my YouTube channel, and that thing is one of the most popular videos I've put up on there because it's it's just uh, well, I just well, took a small clip of y'all talking and, about it. So now now to, to be fair. Um, um, when Rob and I get together and talk, it, do, it does get, it gets a little more unhinged. It gets a little unhinged. So, so yeah, we had a lot of fun with that one. Actually, that was uh, and that's uh, something that we will do from time to time. And I think you and I have even done it on the show from time to time. Is just gather a a big wad of semi connected resource material and just go through it. You know, and oh, just yeah. study it. Oh yeah, let's read this. And, and uh, that's kind of what me and Rob did there. Uh, Rob Clark, of course, the, the host of the still on hiatus, the Lone Gunman podcast. Um, and uh, he hasn't gone away, guys. He's just uh, taking a break. But Rob, um, I, there was a 400 and I believe 37 page file on David Ferry that turned up in the new uh, the new releases. And we just kind of went through that. And uh uh, read some things and you know pointed out some contradictions and pointed out uh, you know new things that maybe we didn't know and uh, we did have a lot of fun with that that's for sure you know this uh i'm looking still at that spy seminars website and yeah. that, that this family plane is I th she's getting ready to run for the senate um and the mayor was at this event, and the people in the audience, you know, they are older people, but yeah. I suspect this is something connected with her running for office, like, um, you know, trying to get people to know her in the community or, or whatever. It, actually, I went to an event like that uh, where I live in, uh, well, I, I drove to it, but it was in Charlottesville. I saw uh, <clears throat> Colonel Larry Wilkerson speak. And he was doing it with someone running for office, uh, running for Congress. So I th that's probably what the purpose of this conference actually was, was to help this woman get more of a platform in, in New Mexico and something connected with her running for office. That's probably the real purpose of it. More name recognition. Yeah, yeah. Or, or get money yeah. from these from people. Yeah, just get supporters. So. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting uh, that she asked him to speak. Yes, it is. Uh, if, we, if, if I lived there, I would have gone to it. It would be very interesting. Then we could ask these oh, people wow. yeah. <laughs> ourselves what the world they're talking about this for. <laughs> if, you know, if one of us, though, somebody, you know, from our community were to would just walk up and start asking the guy really detailed questions, he it would probably surprise him, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it would. Yeah. I'm sure there are plenty of people, there are probably people in, in our research community that could teach him a thing or two about Jacob Esterline. Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure because his name shows up yeah. on some of the documents. He was an important figure. That's right, man. People like Bill Simpich and uh, John Newman, man, those are, uh, those are the, the big know, I don't know what guy. he did after the Bay of Pigs. Yeah, I don't know where what happened to him afterwards. I don't remember. He ended up didn't he end up chief of the West, uh, chief of Western Hemisphere? Oh, was he? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. I wrote it down in my notes. I could look it up for you. Yep. Uh, all of his. Uh, yep. That that would make sense. Uh, let's see. It is in my notes. I just guys, I get. Uh, so much stuff bouncing around in my head. Let's see. Uh, what is it? Jacob Esterline. I had a few. Uh, maybe I did. Yeah, it's in here somewhere, but uh, I have to find it. It oh, makes for right. boring radio. Yeah. And he died. He died in Hendersonville, North Carolina. So that's fun. In 1999, I know. I'm looking at his Wikipedia entry. I know where that is. <laughs> Been there actually. <laughs> so, but well, anyway, I'll let you go. I don't want to keep you all day. And I recommend everyone check out your podcast, subscribe to it, and, and uh, listen to the episodes and learn more, get more information because it's uh, fantastic. 
man, I thank you for the kind words. I truly do. Uh, the, the podcast is uh, the Dallas Action presented by Wall Street Window. WallStreetWindow.com is our primary sponsor. Um, we love Wall Street Window. They keep the lights on over there for us, man. 